Hello, this is Dr. Ominde. We continue with our cranial nerve um, series. We are now on the seventh cranial nerve, and that's the facial nerve. So, the facial nerve um, uses um, different nuclei. Sorry, it uses different um, nuclei. So, we have the facial nuclei, which is uh, motor to the muscles of facial expression. We have superior salivary nuclei. This one is usually just rostral to the medallopontine junction. This one um, carries preganglionic parasympathetic efferents that control the submandibular and the lacrimal glands. Then we also have gastatory nucleus and nucleus of tractor solitarius. So these ones receive um, test uh, fibers. Okay, They receive test fibers from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, the nose, and the palate. Then the last one is the spinal nucleus of trigeminal. It's spinal nucleus of trigeminal, but it's some fibers get to facial nerve. It receives general sensory afferent fibers from the um, from the parts of the of the face. Gen, uh, general somatic afferent fibers from parts of the face. So those are the four nuclei of facial nerve: facial, motor nuclei, superior salivary nucleus to submandibular and lacrimal gland, gastatory nucleus for uh, nucleus of tractor solitarius for test, and spinal nucleus of trigeminal receiving general somatic afferent from the, this part of the, the face. So what are the functional components of facial nerve? So there's the brachiomotor, that special visceral efferent to the muscles of facial expression, digastrics, thylohyoids, and this are, are actually from facial nerve proper. Then we have general visceral efferents. These are the parasympathetics to submandibular, sublingual, lacrimal, palatine, pharyngeal, oral, nasal glands. Then there is general visceral afferent, okay, sensory. So from nasal cavity, sinus cavities, and part of soft palate. Then special visceral afferent, special sensation. So this is test from anterior two thirds of the tongue. Then general somatic afferent from the pin of the ear and external auditory meter. So these are the functional components of facial nerve. What's the origin of facial nerve? It comes from, um, it exits. So you find it at the cerebellopontine angle, at the lateral part of the pontomedullary junction. So you'll see two roots. There's a motor root, which is larger and more medial. And then we have the nervous intermediates, which is smaller and more lateral. And this nervous intermediates contains parasympathetic and sensory fibers of facial nerve. What's the inter intracranial um, course of this nerve? Um, the from the cerebellopontine angle, facial nerve crosses uh, posterior cranial fossa, then it will enter what we call the internal acoustic meters, together with the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibular cochlea. Then the nervous intermediate portion, which has sensory and parasympathetic components, it joins the main root of facial nerve within the internal auditory meters. Then we, there's the formation of the geniculate ganglion in the internal auditory meters, and this Geniculate ganglion usually houses the cell bodies of the sensory fibers, but there is no synapsing within this ganglion. Okay. The nerve after that will turn posteriorly into the facial canal within the petrous temporal bone. After it has um, turned posteriorly in the facial canal, it gives an, a branch to stapedius muscle. This is a muscle that is attached to the steps, which is an ossicle of the ear. Then after that, coda tympani branch is given off. This happens just before facial nerve exits through the stylomastoid foramen. So it will pass anteriorly and cross the tympanic membrane into the infratemporal fossa, where it, thereafter it joins the lingual nerve. Then what happens? The facial nerve now emerges through the stylomastoid foramen. So this is the facial nerve here. Remember, it goes around the nucleus of abducens. So this is the motor, main motor nucleus, and this is the parasympathetic, okay, uh, superior salivary tree and lacrimal nuclei. So all these form the facial um, nerves, okay, from all these nuclei. And this is your colliculi, facial nerve going around the abducens nucleus. Okay, so what are the uh, 
branches of facial nerve that are given within the facial canal. We have greater petrosal nerve, nerve to stapedius, and coda tympani. Okay, those will be given off within the facial canal in the ear, middle ear. Then we have extracranial course of the facial nerve. Now, after it has left the stylomastoid foramen, what happens? It will give a branch to occipital belly or occipital frontalis of the scalp, a branch to stylohyoid muscle, to posterior belly of digastric, and the skin of external auditory meatus. This is mainly sensory. After that, the facial nerve enters the parotid gland, where it forms an intricate plexus, it forms the pes and serine, it resembles a duck foot. That's why it's called pes and serine of facial nerve. This will emerge superficially from anterior border of the gland. So it's made up of five branches, the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and cervical branches, and this supply muscles of facial expression. So you have your temporal, towards the temporal region, okay, zygomatic, the buccal, mandibular, and cervical. So those are the branches of facial nerve after it exits, after it exits the anterior part of the, the parotid gland. Again, you can appreciate temporal, zygomatic, and you have your buccal here, mandibular and cervical branches. This is where the facial nerve at the cerebellopontine angle, you can see the geniculate ganglion before it enters. Within facial canal, we say it gives uh, nerve to stapedius, coda tympani, and greater petrosal. Now there's greater petrosal here, there's coda tympani here. And then before it leaves the stylomastoid foramen, where it will give some branches to some muscles such as uh, uh, occipital belly or occipital frontalis, you have the uh, posterior belly of digastric and so on and so forth. So you have temporal nerve to the upper face, so bicularis, oris, and frontalis, zygomatic nerve to the middle portion of the face, buccal to the vaccinators, uh, mandibular to the lower face, and cervical nerve below the chin, innervating muscles such as platysma. So again, this is your facial nerve, that's your motor root and sensory roots, okay? Then you can appreciate as it gets to the facial canal, that turn, there's a nerve to stapedius, there's greater petrosol, but it also gives quarter tympani. So those are the three nerves that will be given off within the canal. And then this um, nerve to stapedius, that's muscle attached to steps, quarter tympani, Will be joined by lingual nerve okay and you can see it's going to innervate the the tongue this lingual uh, you can see the connection with the submandibular and the sublingual glands then after that the facial nerve comes this way exit through stylomastoid foramen it gives branch to occipitalis to posterior belly of digastry to stylohyoid before it pierces the parotid and gives the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and cervical branches to muscles of facial expression. Right. Now, remember the greater petrosol that is given in the facial canal will be joined by deep petrosol. Together, they form the nerve of pterygoid canal. This nerve of pterygoid canal is the preganglionic fiber. It will synapse at the pterygopalatine ganglion, and the postganglionic goes to innervate the lacrimal gland. Coda tympani forms the preganglionic fiber, synapse at submandibular ganglion to cause postganglionic uh, post to cause submandibular gland secretions. So, what are the causes and sites of injury of facial nerve? If you have vascular lesion of the brainstem, remember it's exiting through the brainstem, so that can affect it. A tumor within the cerebellopontine angle, such as a tumor of the eighth cranial nerve, acoustic neuroma, then edema. Fluid accumulation within the facial canal can affect facial nerve. Hapis zoster can affect the geniculate ganglion of facial nerve. Then you can have inflammation within the ear and the mastoid can affect facial nerve. Remember, it's passing through internal lacastic meatus and entering the ear. The facial canal is in the ear. Then mumps, which is viral infection affecting the parotid gland or tumors of the parotid can affect facial nerve. And in birth trauma, for example, during forceps delivery, you can injure the facial nerve as it's exiting the stylomastoid foramen. So the facial nucleus, upper facial, uh, a part that is innervating the upper facial muscles and a part to the lower facial muscles. Lower motor neurons are from the nucleus to the muscles. 
So the cell bodies of lower motor neurons to the upper facial muscles receive upper motor neurons from both cerebral motor cortices. So the nerves that are going to upper part of the face receive control from right and left cerebral cortices. But the lower motor neurons to lower parts of the face, the muscles of the lower part of the face, they only receive control from the opposite cerebral cortex. So upper motor neuron to the lower part of the face comes from contralateral side, while upper motor neuron control to the upper part of the face comes from both sides. So in upper motor neuron lesion of facial nerve, what happens? Upper motor neuron lesion. The forehead and opicularis opule muscles will be spared. Why? Because we've said the muscles of the upper part of the face are controlled by both sides of the brain. So if you just injure upper motor neuron on one side, those muscles can still be controlled by the other side. So their action will be spared. While the muscles on the lower part of the face, if you get upper motor neuron lesion, the muscles of the lower part of the face will get paralyzed on the contralateral aspect. Why? Because muscles on the lower part of the face are controlled by the opposite um, cerebral cortex. So there's contralateral control. So patients are able to close both eyes and wrinkle in upper motor lesion and there's no muscle atrophy because upper motor neurons don't directly um, um, contact the muscle. Okay, so this is what we mean. The nuclei of the facial nerve are on the, the brainstem, but they're getting upper motor neurons from the cerebral cortex. So upper motor neuron, if you're coming to the upper part of the face, this purple, yeah, these nerves are purple, they get control from both cerebral cortices. You can see purple on right and left side. But if you're coming from lower parts of the face, controlling muscles in the lower part of the face, these nerves are controlled by the brain of the opposite side, the cerebral cortex of the opposite side. So you can see this side is controlling this muscle and this side will control muscles on this lower part. So if there's a lesion here, this is upper motor. You can see these are upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons begin here. If you have a lesion here, upper motor neuron lesion here, what will happen? So you just follow this. The lower part of the opposite side will be affected and the upper part will be spared because it can be controlled by this side because the upper part of the face gets control from both cerebral cortices. But in lower motor neuron lesion, what happens? Remember, the cell bodies of uh, these lower motor neurons are within the nucleus of facial, motor nucleus of facial nerve. So a lesion anywhere in the cause of the facial nerve will lead to lower motor neuron lesion. And that's what we call facial palsy. Like any other lower motor neuron lesion, there's usually flaccid paralysis of the ipsilateral muscles. So we call this um, lower motor neuron lesion Bell's palsy if the injury occurs when the nerve is exiting after it exits the stylomastoid foramen. So Bell's palsy is lower motor neuron facial palsy after it exits for, from stylomastoid foramen. What are the clinical features of lower motor neuron lesions of facial nerve? There will be disappearance of normal folds in the face, such as the wrinkles and creases. The corner of the mouth will droop with drooling saliva. The patient will not be able to close the eye. The cornea will dry out. And with time, the muscles will atrophy like any other lower motor neuron lesion. Food will accumulate in the vestibule because vaccinator is not working. Then the face will deviate to the normal side because of facial asymmetry. And there will be absent nasolabial fold. So you can see this is lower motor neuron lesion of facial nerve. When you ask the patient to smile, the face deviates to the normal side. So the normal side will have wrinkles, will have the nasolabial fold, but this other side, there are no wrinkles, no nasolabial fold. Mouth always deviates towards the normal side. So upper motor neuron lesion, the upper part of the face will be spared. Lower motor uh, upper part, upper motor neuron lesion spares the upper part but affects the contralateral side of the lower face. Then lower motor neuron lesion affects halfway. So this is upper motor neuron lesion, only lower part of the face is affected, contralateral part of the face. But in lower motor neuron lesion, ipsilateral half of the face, same side of the face, but half, all of it up to down in lower motor neuron lesion. 
upper motor neuron lesion affects contralateral opposite side of lower part of the face. Again, 